Hello and welcome to this MIMAsTraining.com presentation on innovations in suicide prevention. My name is Tom Pansella with the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. Thanks for taking the time to take this training program. We're joined by Dr. Paul Quinette, and Paul is the president and CEO of the QPR Institute, which is a national training program for suicide prevention. He's the author, among other things, of QPR for Suicide Prevention, which is a public health gatekeeper training program, and it's currently taught in 36 states nationwide. And several other books, including the best-selling Suicide, The Forever Decision, which is in four languages and received international recognition, and his new Counseling Suicidal People, A Therapy of Hope. He conducts many national workshops and seminars on suicide prevention, intervention, and therapy for clinicians and counselors, and serves as the secretary of the board of the, of the American Association of Suicidology. It's also on several other national boards. His Spokane mental health team has uh, won the prestigious J.J. Negley and Associates 1998 President's Award for Avoiding Suicide Malpractice. Dr. Quinette also serves as clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And he is the chair of Spokane Mental Health's APA-approved psychology internship program. And Paul, no, thanks thank for joining you. us. <laughs> thank it's you. It's quite a bio. You've been in the field for more than 40 years now. So what brought you here? Brought me to Missouri. Brought you to the cause. Brought me to the cause. What brought me to the cause was um, inheriting when I took my first public sector job after working in hospitals. I took the job as the director of adult services for a, a developing mental health center at the time. And included in that job was the operations of a crisis line. So that was in 1970, and I uh, was the director of outpatient services and uh, the crisis service line and recruiting volunteers and training them and so forth. So we got, I got into suicide prevention sort of by default. I don't think I would have left school thinking, oh boy, I want a career in this. So that's how I got started. And so why is this a significant issue? Why are we, why are we talking about this? Why do we want to talk about well, this? Well, in my case, the, it became a personal matter in the sense that uh, over the early years of our agency, and I was there for 30 years at Spokane Mental Health, which at the time was one of the largest mental health centers in the country. We wrote a federal grant. We built a large uh, network of services throughout our county and uh, developed a whole lot of different programs. But interestingly, at the peak of our powers, as it were, we were seeing about 10,000 patients a year uh, coming through our child family and outpatient and our inpatient networks and so forth. And uh, every year we would lose patients to suicide. They would take their own lives while they were in our care. And that became uh, a cause for me. It was like, well, wait a minute, am I hiring people who are not well trained or is this something that's preventable or what's the cause here? And um, so I began to explore that because I had to conduct the fatality reviews of the people who had died, being the director of all the clinical services. Uh, long story short, I eventually started to treat some suicidal patients. I always had an active patient contact uh, as part of my job as a director, just to keep my feet on the ground, as it were, with the troops. And uh, I began to see suicidal patients. One of them was named Mary. She had made uh, two serious overdoses. And uh, I saw her with a psychiatrist colleague of mine for three or four years. And at the end of that episode of learning from her what it was like to be uh, in a suicidal state of mind, I wrote this first book, The Suicide, The Forever Decision, which has now uh, gone around the world. It's available free, by the way. You can go to our website and download it, upload it to yours, to wherever you like. In fact, we're working on an Apple uh, iPad application for it so people can download it anywhere in the world. Excellent. We'll make sure we make yeah. that resource available. Yeah. Um, so you've seen a lot then in, in those 40 years. There's got to be things that, that, that are, have been rewarding to you and things that have been kind of disturbing sure. to you. Kind of give us, a, give us an overview. Well, the disturbing things have been to see people die needlessly, in my view. They were, these were preventable deaths. The Surgeon General, Dr. David Satcher, a hero of mine, said this was our most preventable death. And so if that's true, then why are we not doing a better job of that? Uh, also, our professions, the helping professions, are impacted by suicide in sort of unstudied ways. Number one being uh, if you lose a patient to suicide, it's a traumatic event for you and it can be career ending for some young therapist. But there's also suicide among our ranks, among mental health professionals. So in my case, uh, my supervising social worker during my internship took her life two years after I left the hospital. Uh, one of the directors of our inpatient unit a hospital I worked in took his life about a year after I left that hospital. And over the course of the years, I've known a number of people in mental health who've ended their own lives. And you would think if people 
if this is a preventable death, then why don't we know more about this and why can't we make a difference? So that's sort of how I got involved in it. Then I got involved with my clients. In fact, toward the end of my career, both as I had a private practice for a short time, a limited private practice, I pretty much exclusively saw suicidal people. They're the most interesting. What uh, You talked a little bit about working with professionals uh, and, and losing professionals in the field. Have you been working with them as well? Yes. Yeah, I'm a part of an international survivors of suicide uh, task force, uh, or a group actually is functioning now for clinicians who've lost patients to suicide. And it's, it's growing very quickly because about a sixth of people who end their own lives in America are in care with somebody. And so you can imagine the trauma of having a patient you're trying to help uh, die while you're trying to help them. Physicians in, get trained for this. They sort of deal with death every day, but not in mental health. We don't expect people to die. And we don't tell our, our graduate students that this is a potential occupational hazard to them. So how do you approach that? Well, in, uh, I, right now that we are providing online and uh, support and research, there are uh, a network of people uh, who provide support and help to clinicians who've lost somebody. But uh, more importantly is we need to be better skilled and better trained in how to assist suicidal people because the field is, I'm sorry to say, is uh, not done a good job of preparing students. Most of the graduate schools in all the major mental health professions except psychiatry spend very little time on the subject of suicide prevention. What would you like to see done differently? Well, I'm actually part of a national task force that's drafting a white paper for the American Association of Suicidology uh, asking that the graduate schools and the public be aware that, um, that there is this training deficit. It's not, we didn't point it out, it's pointed out in the Surgeon General's National Strategy for Suicide Prevention, Goal 6 specifically says we need better training, better preparation for clinicians in the field in this area, and then the Institute of Medicine's reducing uh, <clears throat> suicide, this national imperative, also addresses this training deficit. So we're, we've formed a group of about nine people and the goal is to produce a kind of a white paper of what, what we know currently, what's been the history, and what's needed in the future, and then hope to influence some legislation perhaps. In fact, I just met with Senator, or not Senator Kennedy, but um, Congressman Kennedy about four months ago with two other colleagues to encourage him to, to include some language in the health uh, bill that would address this issue of uh, patient safety. Now you work with um, student populations a lot? Yes, I train psychiatry residents and less so psychologists. Now my bio is a little dated now. I've left uh, Spokane Mental Health and I'm not uh, chairing the, in, the internship program anymore, but uh, I still am on the faculty at the University of Washington School of Medicine and, and I train psychiatrists in, in this area. So. And you train people to work with youth? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how do you, what, what's your approach to people working with young people? Well, I mean, I, I think the fundamentals of, of counseling serve pretty well with there. With the, the problem, that is being empathetic and understanding and, and being able to uh, know the sort of needs and developmental sequences that youth go through. But uh, more importantly, the, we need to be a lot more uh, candid in talking about this. Kids don't have any trouble talking about this at all. In fact, I got so concerned about it, I put one of my granddaughters on my advisory board <laughs> to tell Grandpa what needs to be done for kids. Uh, and, you know, and that's what led to some of the innovations we're doing now, which is sort of entering into the social network theories, and uh, not theories, but the applications of modern media, new media, and, and web-based interventions. Because these kids are dealing with each other's suicidal friends texting. All you gotta do is be around a kid for a few minutes. They make more text messages now than phone calls, and they won't call you. You want to talk to your granddaughter, you better text her. <laughs> so what, uh, you, you, you've gone into this now, you, you're talking about innovations yeah. and talking about the, the tools that are out there that are different than they used to be and, right, and rapidly right. changing. Um, give, us a, give us a flavor for what, what it is that you're, how you're working with them. Well, we got started in this, uh, number one, we've developed a number of online training programs through our university partner, Eastern Washington University School of Social Work. So we, we began delivering training online, uh, educational programs, both for college credit for continuing education. <clears throat> but what we realized, and it was watching the, the arc of human communications, is that people were going to text messaging 
and going away from phone calls, which puts all the crisis lines in the country, which I used to be a director of one, uh, makes us outmoded. If, people, if kids want to text us to a teen line and we're not trained and prepared to take a text message, then a service not delivered is a service denied. So that, that simply is not, to me, it's not acceptable because we, I've collected uh, emails from crisis lines all over the country to build a new training program to train volunteers and professionals in how to respond in a text-only world in cyberspace. And I'd like to go there a little bit because yeah. you're, it, it, talk therapies revolve around a lot of conversation. Right, right. Text <clears throat> messaging revolves around very short snippets right. of things. And so how do you teach people to read these different Well, actually, the text messaging is not new. People communicated this way. 1888 um, London, the post arrived every half hour on the hour for 12 hours a day. So you could text back and forth and have communication every hour with somebody throughout the city. It cost you a few tuppence, but... But nowadays, uh, what's happening is that e-mental health is, is growing in popularity. Our team is part of an international network that's testing and evaluating online mental health services. Telepsychiatry is many years old. That's where you have the video content mm -hmm. interaction with the patient. But uh, this sort of texting mental health, the Australian Army just did a big survey of all these available services. Our VA hospital system, they're very much leaders in this. And they now have text crisis services through their 1-800 number. And so veterans can text. And the reason that uh, so many people want to use text is that it's completely anonymous. They can't trace the call. So their they're, they're emails are very open. They're very forthright. There's not, it's, as you know, text communications differ from the way people voice things. So there are lots of questions. In fact, I have a lot of research teams interested in helping us evaluate this. But bottom line is we have, words have always changed behavior. And so if we have the capacity to interact with people online, and there are millions of them online who are looking for ways to die and ways to live. And right now there are more ways to die than there are ways to live. So we need to have a presence in cyberspace and and how that gets done. I've been talking to a number of organizations about about launching this. It's a very, the training program, I'll talk about it probably the later part today, but it's a rigorous 40 hour online training program to work only online. And a lot of the practice challenges and interactive pieces are built on text only. You get the following email, how do you respond? Right. Four choices. Yeah. And we just beta tested it uh, globally. We had beta testers in Kuwait and UK and uh, Singapore. I mean, we had them all over the world. And how did it go? It was great. Yeah, people loved it. But it's, it is a commitment. It's 40 hours of pretty hard work. And how, did, how um, do people get to you then? How, does, how do people find how to, how to get your information? Well, they just come to our website, and, the, and uh, we're happy to send. We're just now... Uh, this last week, in fact, released information about this to the sort of insider groups within uh, suicide prevention. Not everybody's seen it yet, um, but we're uh, hooked up with iCarol.com, which is a a software program that builds nonprofit uh, uh, systems for telephonic and text. Now, that was what they've been working on this last year. They realized that there are multiple channels of communication now, and that modern crisis response systems have to be able to respond across these channels. So we've been sort of working a little bit with them. We're not, we're not in a business arrangement, but, but, they're, but, but as a crisis line, you can plug in their system and then integrate phone and text. And then the missing piece was how do you train people to work in text? And so that's what we took on was we were going to teach people how to um, detect, assess, and do crisis intervention safety planning, and in some cases counseling, because some of the people doing this work will be professionals, and, and there's already a whole network of online therapists, not just here. around India has 3,200 3, e-psychologists already doing this. How do you do e-psychology? E in, in, in kind it's of just, a nutshell, how do you do that? Well, it, 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 you, you're, you're in a live chat, so you're in instant messaging, so you just chat back and forth. And they say something, and you say something, and they say something. And the, the benefit of it is, one of them is, that you actually have time to think over what you're going to say. And people say, well, I can't see any body language. And sometimes that's good. 
because then you treat everybody, you don't know if they're black, white, or Indian, or Chinese, you don't, you don't know anything about them, and they don't know anything about you. And it's interesting because we took the QPR program to Australia and New Zealand, I just got back from New Zealand, and they're going all electronic training, all online. They're, they're, they're very, I wouldn't say they're uninterested in face-to-face -face training, but in some ways it's not practical. And for most of rural America, and a lot of our Indian reservations that we hope to get bandwidth, there are no mental health services. There are none. So the thing that I get most upset about is that you can become suicidal in America due to a treatable brain disorder in most cases, in lots of cases, and you can literally die out in, the, out in the backwoods of Wyoming because you can't get any treatment. We wouldn't tolerate that for diabetes or any other life-threatening illness. We would say that's wrong. And yet people who are dying from these, these psychiatric illnesses get no access to care at all. So the, the benefits of being able to do something, at least online, is very, very powerful to me. And, uh, and we, know, we know that these people will, will get online and that they will check, because 90% of the men right now are getting all their health information from the web. They don't go to doctors. They get on the web. Well, You're laughing because you've already been well, there, Tom. It's, it's true for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Men are notorious for not going for not going to the doctors. That's right, and that's our that's our other high risk group. And so a lot of the training in this training program we put together deals with veterans, deals with men, and it deals with isolated people. One of the scenarios is a, uh, a gay boy in Wyoming who's coming out. Just told his family they got upset. You know, it's just a kind of a clinical case thing. And online, somebody can engage with him in a small little town in Wyoming, and take him you know, where help him adjust and get ready for this, but reduce his sense of shame and fear, perhaps, and, and the burdensomeness he may feel about his family, and get him linked into online services and support, and the, you know, the Trevor Group. There's all kinds of resources available to him through the web that are not available in that little town. Besides the, the, the chat, what other kinds of tools are you, are you using now? Well, we have, we're, we're, we're moving down the road to deliver, uh, first of all, <clears throat> we're, going, we're working on an application for all mobile phones for uh, the QPR training so that you can dial in anywhere and take the training uh, online. We're going to build an app for the Forever Decision book, so that's free, and I'm sort of working on a, uh, something that a suicidal person can do for themselves. Like, here's some things you, you can do, you have a responsibility to do. If you cut your finger, you have a responsibility to stop it from bleeding. You don't need to go to an ER, but if you have the first thought of suicide, this is what it might mean and these are some things you can do. I'm not going to treat people, but I think we can give them some pretty good information, send them to websites where they can get knowledgeable about what might be happening with them and so on. Uh, the other thing is we just were striking a, an arrangement to, to uh, use the QPR training uh, deliverable online or through a webcast to uh, jails in America where we have inmates who need education training. A lot of them have domestic issues and crime issues and they're a very high risk population. They tend to be men, they tend to have substance abuse problems. And so we, we, we want to do is start training the so-called captive audience because they need education and training about their own health and, and moreover to, keep, to help other inmates, to be kind of gatekeepers for other inmates in those systems. So we're, we got a whole lot of things uh, going on. I, I would like to build a 1-800-SUICIDE is another group that we've worked with. In fact, I was one of the founders of that. And we're, we're on the drawing boards as a sort of crisis clinic in the cloud, as it were, where people from anywhere can contact a crisis, a trained person uh, in this, um, in the, in cyberspace and get help without, without having to go drive anywhere. Just, that's why I'm encouraging the expansion of broadband. Obama's plan to get it to rural America. <laughs> I live in rural America and I'd like to have faster speeds. <laughs> Well, you also uh, kind of touched on this a little bit, that, uh, but are you seeing uh, age differences uh, in, in who will use what, what tools? Now, you talked about serving a veteran's population, and I would have automatically leaned towards a, a student population mm -hmm. that would, be, that would yeah. be more prone to using this. But if the VA is, is, is involved, it seems like you're reaching out into different populations, but we also know that... Uh, in, in seniors, there, there are uh, significant issues. Oh, yeah. Are you, are you reaching into that population as well? Well, we'll, we'll go wherever we get a tug. I mean, you know, uh, we, at, in, the, in the sense of building a lot of online delivery, uh, it needs to be evaluated, it needs to be researched as being safe and effective and so forth. But 
that's where the people are. And it's not just young. A lot of our veterans are very young. They're coming out of these wars injured and they're not even out of their 20s. So that's a, that's a very uh, important population. But even in older Americans, I mean, I'm 70, right? And I text and I don't text very much, but I mean, I'm on the computer all day long. My wife's 68, she's texting her grandkids. So the, the, I think there's a lot of more, uh, more group target groups that we're concerned about that we could get to if we had some different, um, different methodologies. Because I, I've been in public mental health, and I got nothing against public mental health, but trust me, from a lot of perceptions out there, uh, people think it's broken. You know, it needed transformation 10 years ago, and not much has changed. We just did a project in Colorado where we developed a specific training program for EMS responders who are first on scene with suicide attempts and completions in their communities. And one of the things in a survey we did with them was that their, their frustration with, with the lack of public mental health services for the people that they bring in from the country who've made suicide attempts. So we, we built a training program to train them in what to say and what to do, how to respond to the families of someone who's died and so forth, because they're out there doing the hard work, you know, every day. So. Tell us a little bit about QPR. Well, it's... Um, it's basically a CPR equivalent for, in my view, I mean, a team of us were working in a federal training grant on depression awareness, recognition, and treatment. One of the, this is one of the, back in the 80s. And one of the things we realized is that clinicians couldn't ask about suicide. You know, they're doing a differential diagnosis for depression, and they didn't get to the S question, as we call it. The, and it's not sex. Sex is easy to talk about. Suicide's hard. It's a real conversation stopper. So. We found that people are almost phobic in their fear about asking about it, for fear their patient might be suicidal and what that meant and so forth. So along the way, uh, this thing kind of came to me in a dream, I suppose, and I'd been working with the public health department in Spokane County and had learned a lot about public health interventions and how they're done. And so we had the CPR sort of concept, which is an emergency response to an emergency life-threatening situation. So that's where the original concept came from. And then we had a, you know, worked on what did it mean, how would it work, how would we train it, and all of that. And, it, it, and so it's, um, uh, if you think about early recognition as the key to preventing the development of more serious medical crises, in the same way, first thoughts of suicide, first suicidal communications indicating somebody's contemplating this, that journey from idea to act needs to be interrupted. And if, you, if nobody responds to your suicide warning signs, and most people send them, then you're left isolated and alone, and you tend to use indirect speech to do that. So the, the cue in QPR is how do you question to clarify what that meant? So if I said to you, well, where I'm going, I won't need my glasses or my watch or my iPhone, and, and you can have them and say goodbye to my friends. I didn't use the word suicide, but what did I tell you? So there's this, I have a whole paper if anybody wants it, it's too long except for a book, but it's the thing suicidal people say, and it has to do with politeness theory and indirect speech. And, pe and the taboo subjects we talk about indirectly. So in the old days, my days, you met a pretty girl and you said, would you like to come up and see my etchings? Well, it wasn't about etchings. It was about, and in Seinfeld, George tells Jerry, uh, she invited me up for coffee but I, wasn't, I didn't want any coffee. And so Jerry straightens him out about she was funny to take, you know, have sex with you. So in the same way, suicidal people communicate indirectly. So we have to train the public in how to recognize that there might be some danger here, and then how do you clarify, is this what you mean by what you said? And if so, then we're going to go get you some help. Looking forward now, how, where would you like to see this field go? <laughs> Well, I, I have great ambitions. We have about 4,000 plus trainers in the U.S. and it's becoming very popular in the sense that we're busy training. I mean, we, I think we trained 180 people in a month and a half as new instructors in New York for the first time once. I think you mentioned 30 some states. It's actually more than that now. Uh, new York wants their first 80 trainers. Some states are very uh, robust. Massachusetts has uh, I don't know how many trainers. They're all listed on our website. But what I, my, my superordinate goal is to see one adult in every family trained. 
just like in CPR. So if you're on a summer vacation and one of your kids, you know, stumbles and falls in the lake and partially drowns, you want to have somebody there that knows what to do. So I realize what that means. I mean, that's a huge number. But I think there are ways to actually do that. And that's what we're experimenting with this fall is bringing in county public health departments. And we'll, we'll help get them rolling by giving them sort of startup prime the pump grants because if you look back over American history, all the major changes in agriculture and Missouri's an agricultural state took place with county-driven pilot projects in, in scientific farming. And what a farmer hears about, he may believe, but what he sees, he has to believe. And so if you show him, and I come from an old farm family up in Iowa, so if you, you show my grandfather you know, you got three more ears of corn on this stock. He didn't have to be told but once. He could see it in his field. Now he's going to adapt that. So my dream is that counties who have reasonably good data on their attempts and completions, more so on their completions, could be incentivized to get started. And we would sort of help them get going. And they would then be able to charge for the training fees to support their own infrastructure. That's kind of the, the plan. I have one county commissioner ready to go on this, so we'll see. But that, that, would be, that would be training millions of people. And then on the other side is, is the clinicians have to be trained in how to be helpful. I mean, you don't want to take suicidal people to doctors who don't know anything about suicide, which is part of the real rub right now. Why don't you plug your website real quick? Oh, it's www.qprinstitute.com. Thanks, Paul. You bet. Thank you for taking the time to take this training program today. Avail yourself of the resources on the web, on the web there. Uh, there's a lot of resources available to you, so please take advantage of that in your, in your practice. Again, thank you thank for you. your time. Appreciate it, Tom. Mm -hmm.